there's opportunities for the supply chain to be much more resilient and much more flexible. And like these inputs can be stored for months at a time. And it's not like this, you know, once you, once an animal is born, like there's a timeline that has to be followed, right? And um, to, to go throughout that process. And um, so, and, and then obviously that, um, the, the, the risk of, of zoonotic disease and what, you know, the risk of future pandemics. I think the work that, that I'm doing around alternative proteins helps reduce that risk. And so um, I, I, I feel more inspired than ever to continue, to continue this work and, and, and think that the pandemic and the, the fragility of the food system that it really um, uh, kind of unveiled um, I think has made others see the importance that, that, that major change needs to be made. Emily Hennessy is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Based in Washington, D.C., Emily is a policy associate at the Good Food Institute and leverages policy to create a sustainable, secure, and just food system via alternative proteins in the United States and beyond. Prior to joining GFI, she worked on sustainable food efforts at Georgia Organics as the Farm to School Director and Director of Programs. Previously, Emily was the Sustainability Programs Coordinator at Emory University's Office of Sustainability Initiatives. She holds a bachelor's degree in cultural anthropology from Emory University and an MPH with a concentration in food systems from the Johnson's Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Emily is a member of her neighborhood community garden on the steering committee for the American Public Health Association Center for Climate Health and Equity, and a Farm Foundation Young Agri-Food Leader. Emily, welcome to the show. I'm so glad to have you here. Thanks so much for having me, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here. Before we uh, started, so uh, we saw, saw your spray bottle that you're starting your gardening and was kind of having a discussion about how you're excited about your new seedlings and and uh, I was telling you about my babies and how how happy I am with my progress on on gardening here in my home you have a long history and and um, education around sustainability climate food um, farm uh, practices uh, different things with public health and that uh, and you have been in this space for a while. Now you're with Super, the Good Food Institute Foundation, and you're kind of really helping with advocacy around food and also the legal aspects around um, how we can get into some different changes in the food systems uh, around uh, the world. But we've just been through this crazy time, this you know mm -hmm. pandemic, Black Lives Matter, a lot of uh, uprest and uh, unease around the world, uh, even with the inauguration and, and crazy things, not only with food, but just our world and civilization frameworks going on. So my question is, um, uh, how have you weathered this crazy time? And, and uh, as, as I began as well, you uh, doing a little gardening with some seedlings, as I'm sure many Americans and people around the world are kind of baking more, cooking more, gardening more, getting this better view at our food systems. But has any of that given you more resilience or what kind of learning lessons have you had out of this time? Yeah, it's um, the fact that we're into April 2021 and have you know, lived through a, a year plus of, of the pandemic is it's, it's hard to wrap your mind around in some ways. Um, you know, professionally, um, the, the transition to pandemic work life was actually quite smooth. Um, the Good Food Institute, everyone except for the policy team is normally remote. Um, we actually opened an office in DC for our policy team in November of 2019. And so, you know, we're in the office for a few months and then had to go home. Um, 
but it was a very smooth transition back to, to remote work. Um, uh, so I feel really lucky in, in those regards. And I mean, I've, I've been employed and healthy throughout the last year. And so, um, you know, it's, it's hard to complain about much when, when you have those two things, when so many people around the world um, uh, haven't. Um, and, you know, I have found gardening to actually be one of the most important aspects of my life over the last year. Um, I think the I've, I've been gardening for, for quite a while and have always found the, the magic of planting a seed and watching it grow to just be awe inspiring. But um, to, to like work with my hands in a, in a time when, when most of the world and my interactions with the world are virtual um, was extremely rewarding. Um, I also, as you mentioned, I'm a member of my neighborhood community garden and luckily the, the city deemed that an essential service. So the, the garden was able to remain open um, all, of, all of last year and so, being able to um, stay connected to community members from afar um, and spend lots of time outside and um, you know cultivate these things that like nourish my body um, uh, were was I think a really important part of, of my resilience and um, during as as kind of winter came I started to you know get itchy for what is what what's you know, I, I want to get my hands back in the soil as quickly as possible. So my husband very generously gave me, got me a, a grow light for, for Christmas this year. So I could start my gardening several months, months earlier. And um, it's been a fun, fun exploration over the last couple of months to um, grow seedlings. And I'm about ready to put some of them in the ground. And, um, and again, like the, I, I feel really lucky to live in a fairly tight-knit neighborhood that, you know, has a very active neighborhood listserv and people are very, there's like a buy nothing Facebook group where people are constantly, you know, trading and swapping things out. And so, um, you know, a neighbor had um, some milkweed seeds that she was distributing to neighbors. And so I've um, been giving my hand at, um, you know, growing milkweed, which are, which is really important for, for, for butterflies. And um, I think, again to me like it's there's there are so many connections back to food and how food brings people together um and I I love that food is such a big part of my life both personally and professionally during this pandemic you probably saw as I did and others around the world that food is an essential service and that's uh the, the microscope, the systemic problems really bubble to the surface, but also the microscope really shone down on food in all different aspects, where it's broken, how the shelves in the grocery store, uh, certain shelves were cleared out entirely. And then if you walk a few aisles to the fresh produce, actually they were pretty good for, for a long time in, in the fresh produce. And that also these local gardens, these uh, corner gardens, uh, which are turned more from flowers and to other kind of cosmetic type of uh, plants to more food. You know, you could grab an apple off a tree, you could grab a plum or an apricot or you wherever you're at in specific regions. There are some of those things you could take back and eat from peas to beans, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> That's really nice. But also, people were then baking more at home. Uh, I personally, years ago, went through the transition of not just buying my seeds somewhere else and, 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 and then growing and planting them and doing the gardening, but where I actually started my own seed banking. So based off of my past uh, growth, then I would take the seeds and, and dry them and, and store them and get them ready for the next rounds of of my planting, um, be, I wanted to plant them all immediately, but there's just <laughs> yeah. there's not there's just not enough room to that, and it also doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, but there there's a lot of learning lessons that you can get when you not only plant food, you garden, but uh, during this time, we've just seen the the importance of food. Are there any other learning lessons that you've kind of gotten during this pandemic where you're saying, you know, this this confirms to me 
that uh, we have a broken food system or we need some changes or how vital it is that something that maybe we hadn't been focused in on or that wasn't always in the forefront, we were leaving it up to other organizations to deliver our food to us, but how much better it is that we get involved and understand how it all actually all works. Yeah, I mean, I think what happened with the, the, the meatpacking plants in the US was a big slap in the face to a lot of Americans about, you know, really what, what the process of our food system looks like and, and where there are some serious pain points. Um, you know, it was just horrible images to, you know, to see the millions of animals that had to be killed and, and not be not be eaten at all um, uh, because of the, the the kind of the blocks and the issues with the, the supply chain and and so I think in a lot of ways it it for me like reaffor reaffirmed the importance of the work that I'm doing you know that the world of alternative proteins although you know it's still a fairly young industry but we we vision this world that um, you know that for instance, for like plant-based meat products, um, the same inputs can be used for plant-based pork versus plant-based chicken versus plant-based beef in a lot of ways. And so um, there, there's opportunities for the supply chain to be much more resilient and much more flexible. And like these inputs can be stored for months at a time. And it's not like this, you know, once you, once an animal is born, like there's a timeline that has to be followed, right? And um, to, to go throughout that process. And um, so, and, and then obviously that um, the, the, the risk of, of zoonotic disease and what, you know, the risk of future pandemics, I think the work that, that I'm doing around alternative flow proteins helps reduce that risk. And so, um, I, I I feel more inspired than ever to continue to continue this work and 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 think that the pandemic and the the fragility of the food system that it really um, uh, kind of unveiled um, I think has made others see the importance that 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 major change needs to be made um, and I you know I think that we the, the pandemic has been one crisis but like you know, increased natural disasters. Like there, there we we know that there are going to be continue continued crises um, in the future, and that we can either take charge and work to make changes, or we can um, we can continue with the the status quo. And I think there's a a growing number of individuals and organizations and policymakers and you know funders who who recognize that it's it's. It's now or never, really, when it comes to um, taking taking charge and shifting gears. It's it's not only in the the U.S. It's all around the world, and you're in a unique position, place in Washington D.C. for the U.S. food system, for especially on a federal level, to to be positioned there for changes in and the way things occur in the, in the food system and and the policies around them. Um, because there um, has always been a big advocacy and lobbyists in the food systems, but in almost a negative way, almost a monopoly type of a way that uh, is not good for everyone's benefit. Um, in Germany, we actually saw the same things with the meat industry. So we had Tonus, which Tonus is a big uh, uh, meat producer in Germany, and huge problems. And I think everywhere in the world around mass produced and big industrial scale animal, uh, not just agriculture, but production where they're actually doing the slaughtering and the cutting of, of, of the meat and things. Um, not only are those working conditions not futuristic, not ready, uh, not worthy of human, there's no social distancing, there's bad working conditions, bad hours, low labor, um, not a lot of safety things in there. And because they kind of felt this demand, there was those things bubbled out to the surface. Of course, the horrific things that occur uh, with animal uh, meat production and consumption in that respect on the production side uh, is horrific enough. But the human 
working yeah. conditions and those things are also another almost breeding ground for illness, for pandemics, for spreading of those, because there is not that automation, that social distancing, that good working conditions, fair wage, fair trade, so to say, in 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 that industry, even in Germany, which is highly uh, developed in that, and w w there was recalls. Shelves were empty for meats, and, and meat counters were empty for a long time. So There's all sorts of crazy issues going around that, and and really, that's as consumers, as public, that's what we see. But, and I and I probably want to get your feelings or your understanding of this. The entire food industry has really been stuck in the industrial age. And sometimes I joke and tease in the dark ages, a lot of respects on human working conditions and production methods that are not just efficient, but are uh, humane and, and right and, and better systems for this uh, water energy food nexus on how do we use those, those finite resources in a proper way that don't go to waste that that uh, do it right and, and that's I, that's why I like you're discussing um, alternative proteins better way and more sustainable ways of, of, ma of making food but we actually also need to fix that system because there are some practices that have been going on for a long time that are creating huge issues with human suffering and our global grand challenges yeah absolutely I um I grew up in Iowa and um, the, which, you know, is in the center of, of the US. I think there are more pigs in Iowa than there are people. Um, I grew up in the, in the city, but I think it was when I was in high school, there was a, a raid on a meat packing plant because there were um, a, like an ice raid. There were um, um, employees who weren't, who weren't legal immigrants and they, you know, deported a, a whole bunch of people immediately. There were some really horrible stories of like both parents who, who, who were detained and their kids came home and, you know, their, their parents were nowhere to be found. But after, um, after they, they had this raid, they tried to find employees, you know, to fill these slots and none of the local people wanted to work in the meatpacking plant because it was such, you know, miserable work, you know, it, um, it was, it's so difficult and, um, you know, the pay isn't very good and um, literally back, back breaking. And so if I, I might not have the story, not completely correct, it's been a while, but my understanding was that the company went to American Samoa um, because um, because of the work requirements, you know, it was easy to get American Samoans um, approval to, to, to work in the U.S. and advertised, you know, come to the U.S., we'll pay for your, you know, first month's rent or whatever, your transportation, or you'll have a great job. And so this group of American Samoans moved to Iowa um, to work at these meatpacking plants. And I, I think most of them quit after a short period of time because, again, it's just such... Um, um, unethical work in a lot of ways. It's um, so yeah, you're totally right. I think there are there are issues throughout our food system um, in terms of the environment and and people and and animals. Um, but I feel very optimistic that there are also plenty of of, of solutions and lots of smart people in the world who um, feel like they want to make make changes to make this make this better for everybody. There's there's definitely so many more things we could go in. We don't want to be, be too dystopian or too negative. Um, you know, there's tons of racism. You mentioned America, Samoa, so that's not not just in in, in um, Samoans and Tongans, but there's Asians and people of color and uh, immigrants and Hispanics and and on and on that uh, get pulled into these lines of work because nobody else wants to do it. And it's something that uh, it's been going on for a long time and, and people haven't been talking about it because it's, it's really big history that some of us didn't learn in, in school or we don't understand the connections that a lot of our big history is tied to food, whether it's Native Americans mm -hmm. and, and the big food and, and sovereignties and injustices that uh, occurred to Native Americans, or whether it's in India with uh, Gandhi and and uh, the the salt marches, which was all based around food and 
and race and, and uh, unifying countries and this old colonialism and time and time, there's always these, these issues that pop up and they're starting to bubble to the surface. The, the, the thing that's really kind of enlightening for me is that for, for many decades, we've had a, almost a disconnect with uh, human beings and our food. We've kind of left that up to 10 or 20 big major corporations to produce all our food for us. And as long as they deliver it to the shelves and it makes it on our plate, we just, and that's cheap, then, then it's okay. Uh, with that in mind, um, in 2008, the entire world uh, kind of shifted from financial markets, tech markets, and uh, the economy shifted to anything to do with the food systems. And it turned food into a commodity. And when that occurred, when food became a commodity in 2008 and all and anything you invested in, anything with the food systems, it actually cheapened food. So the people who were behind the production of food uh, were, were only cared about what their profit margin was, is how they got their return. And, and so they were trying to produce it as cheap as possible, the worst ingredients and the labor and everything, just to get it as cheap and get it out there so that they could get that return. And that's a market that has grown uh, even during the pandemic, time over time, since 2008 till today, it's one that's grown at least a billion uh, a trillion, sorry, a trillion a year at the very least, and 99 billion uh, in, in Europe alone. It's a huge market. And um, so that's why it's continued to thrive. But what we did is by turning food into a commodity, we've actually cheapened food, which in turn cheapens life and how we look at, at food and that we've got this disconnect. And now there's this big awareness and it's been moving more and more this is what I really want to get into you with you today. You with the Good Food Institute are part of the United Nations uh, Food Systems Summit for uh, which is all about global food reform, improving food sovereignty, food security, hunger, poverty, and, and fixing the broken food system on all levels. There's six action tracks. There's um, food system dialogues, there's food champions and food heroes, there's CEOs of organizations around food now coming to the table. It was supposed to occur in 2020 and they've moved it because of the pandemic 2021 and they're gonna have the first launch in, um, I think it is in June in Rome, if I mm -hmm. remember correctly. And then later in September in, in New York, you guys, have been doing work for a long time, for years uh, on food and plant-based uh, alternatives and now really alternative proteins. You've been moving in this direction regardless. Tell me how that journey has been and now that you're involved in the UN Food System Summit, why, how, where's that going? What's your excitement? What, have, what learning lessons have you seen along the way? Yeah, so, the, the Good Food Institute is just over five, five years old, and it started just in the U.S., but now we have about uh, 65 employees in the U.S. and actually affiliate offices um, in five different regions of the world. So we have a team in Brazil and a team in Israel, a, a team in Europe, a team in India, and a team in the, the Asia-Pacific region, kind of based mostly in Singapore. Um, so it's there's been really exponential growth in, in the past five years. And the, um, the idea behind starting the Good Food Institute was, if you really think about, you know, there have been environmental organizations and animal welfare organizations that for decades have been urging people to, you know, switch to vegetarian diets or to reduce meat consumption. And in a lot of ways that really hasn't worked, you know, meat consumption globally is at an all time high and all of the projections are that that's just going to continue to grow. And so instead of, we're not in the business of telling people what they should or shouldn't eat. We want to help accelerate these industries that, that give people the, the meat and seafood and eggs and dairy that they love, um, but in a way that doesn't have the, the externalities of our current industrial system. 
Um, and I've been at the, the Good Food Institute for, for about a year and a half now. Um, and I mean, it's, it's been really exciting to see the growth just in the past, the past year and a half, but um, even more exciting to think about, you know, what, how, what this industry looked like five years ago and, and, and where we are today. Um, there's tons of work to still be done, especially around price. We know that price needs to decrease in order for um, everyone to have access to alternative proteins. We know that like a lot of um, there are some great like chicken nugget type products and, and ground beef products on the market for plant-based, but you know, there's no, there's no great plant-based salmon filet on the market. There's no, you know, plant-based pork shoulder, um, that that's readily available. We want to, um, we're going to keep working until all of the animal products that, that people want to eat, there are alternatives to that. And um, that's obviously the world of plant-based and then this different world of cultivated um, proteins is, is also rapidly, rapidly growing. And um, this is, you know, growing meat directly from animal cells. Um, some people call it cultured or cell cultured meat. We use the term cultivated. Um, and just last year, Singapore became the first nation to approve cultivated meat for sale. So there's one restaurant right now in Singapore where you can buy a cultivated chicken product. Um, and we expect other countries to probably, you know, to follow suit soon. Um, so all of that being said, it was extremely exciting when we were invited to, to participate in the UN Food Systems um, Summit. We're serving the role as innovation lead for Action Track 2, which is all around sustainable diets and consumption. Um, that being said, you know, there's no guarantee that alternative proteins will, will be, uh, you know, kind of a final menu of solution, you know, on the final menu of solutions for, for the food system summit. We obviously hope that's part of the conversation, but um, that, that that's not guaranteed. Um, but it's been a, it's been a really exciting process. Um, EAT is the group that's facilitating this action track. And um, so it's been, an exciting opportunity to get to collaborate with them. And um, I've been really impressed with, especially the role of, um, or the summit's emphasis on youth involvement in this process. So each action track has a youth vice chair and um, there are youth embedded throughout each action tracks. Um, and it's, it's my first time working on a, a project kind of at this international um, level, at the, at the UN level. So it's been a, a, a big learning experience just in terms of uh, all of the, the, the opinions and the issues that have to be weighed, you know, everything from um, what UN member states, their, their thoughts on the process and um, civil society and um, the kind of the action, the core group of, of, of team members. Um, and it's, it's a big process, you know, even within the sustainable diets and consumption action track, we're talking about everything from breastfeeding to, to how to reduce food waste around the world. And that's just one action, action track. And they're, you know, as you said, they're, they're multiple action tracks. So um, I think the, the, it's also, I think, really important that although the, the kind of the summit is divided into these different sections, we know that food systems don't live in silos, right? Like, all of these things are, are interconnected. And so a lot of the work that's being done right now is to really figure out how to make sure that the, the ideas and the solutions are really um, synergistic across, across action tracks, that all of the voices that want to provide input are have, a, have an avenue for, for providing that input. Um, and there, you know, the, the UN is really stressing that they want this to be a people's summit, that they want the entire world to be able to, to participate. Um, and that's a, you know, that's a big task when you think about the, the, the food systems priorities and, and cultural preferences and languages. Um, so it's, uh, there's, there's a, a lot of work ahead of us, but 
the fact that the UN has decided to host a food system summit um, for the first time is um, is extremely exciting and uh, I think a, a really good sign. And um, I, I think that I, my hope is that there are going to be some really nice synergies related to the the summit and then also the climate conference and in Scotland later this year and that kind of we can continue to look towards the both the sustainable development goals but also the Paris agreement um, and and make sure that we're, we're we're working towards those those goals collectively I really love that you you know the sustainable development goals and the Paris agreement that you that you brought those in. Um, this, all 17 of the sustainable development goals are tied to food, um, 11 of them intrinsically, but all 17 of them all, all touch on on food, food industry, and a facet or facets of the food complex food systems. So they are very complex. You uh, uh, initially mentioned EAT. For my listeners who aren't familiar with EAT, it's the EAT Form, EAT Foundation, Gunhild Stordalen, Johan Rockstrom, um, many other greats who kind of started that organization out of Stockholm, Sweden. And uh, you're in good hands with them. And, and David Navarro has also become recently become a part of the, the EAT. And he does the food systems dialogues as well and created the framework um, or, uh, not only of the five action tracks, but the framework of those food system dialogues. And so it's, it's really uh, interesting and vital. There was also, uh, I did, I feel that same type of, it's not a frustration, but this international organizations uh, like the United Nations and there's even the world, they signed in 2019, a partnership with the World Economic Forum. So there's some intertwinings of the World Economic Forum. And, and it's really this big uh, I, monster beast, I guess. It's very hard to understand all the different interagencies and organizations. Um, the, in, in June is the, the FAO's part in Italy and Rome um, on the Food System Summit, kind of a pre-summit. And even with the COPs, they do a pre-COP and it's usually in Bonn where the UNFCCC sits. Uh, at that meeting in 2000, I think it was 2018. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was 2018. I did a food, a little food event with Impossible Foods, with um, uh, insect protein. I can't, uh, can't think of the name of the, that organization. Um, the EAT form with Brent Locken was with, with EAT at that time. Now he's moved on to WWF and does their food uh, section there. Um, and just many other greats. And I, it is a very complex thing to do anything food, around food at an international organization. I'll just give you a little teaser and insight of what, what occurred before we, like, I kid you not, not even... 30 minutes before we're getting ready to launch this event at the, the, uh, at the UN in Bonn, uh, it's kind of the pre-cop that they did. Um, the director and the partnership, uh, Claire Bell Pujol comes over and says, okay, we've got to be extremely careful. We we're talking about the Eat Lancet report that they did of food in the Anthropocene. And it says, we've just had uh, Chile, we just had um, Brazil, we just had uh, two other countries that are big on animal agriculture, especially beef and, and, and things call and say, this better not be about vegan, plant-based, going to these different diets, no meat and things. And, and, and uh, basically we just came out and says, we're just presenting the science. We're just, it's all about the facts base, uh, presenting the science behind the reports and talking about new, tools for the toolbox. Um, and, and I loved how you mentioned, you know, it's not about really telling people what they can and can't eat or what they should eat, but it's more about that learning and that understanding and that transition where they take a transitional alternative protein to transition over to a new diet or to something else. But it's almost an empowerment of knowledge that they maybe not didn't have before that they make that decision on their own how they want to eat and 
and, and move on because there's a model and, and that this goes all back to the very first question I asked you. There's some very basic regenerative models for life that will get you through a very long, sustainable life to have beautiful futures. But if you don't live them, if you don't apply them, if you don't understand that they exist, then you sort of start to run into health problems. You start to run into environmental problems in your community on how you live and, and, and you know, is that a model that you can continue to sustain uh, over decades, just as a mother, a family, a father, you know, uh, uh, in, in your own life? And as you get those awareness, which I think the Good Food Institute's really done for me and, and for those colleagues that I know over the years, just the awareness and, and the support and the help for different ways of producing, different ways of looking at it. What, what are the alternatives? And, some of them might not be good, Some, but many of them might turn out to be good, but it's a process of discovery along the way. And then you guys usually hold on to those ones that are really have substance and meaning and depth in their organizations that not only just focus on what some would call the future of food, but also take that deep dive into uh, is, is that a, a sustainable business model? Does that harm our finite resources? Does that have the production methods that puts good, good products into our food, you know, that long-term and offer those viable options? So I love the, the work that you guys have done in the past. And now I'm so excited for you guys going into the UN Food System Summit. Um, really, you are focusing now or you were telling me you're very excited about what you're seeing in the movement of youth and the direction of youth. I would like to know, uh, most of the youth that I know are already vegan or kind of going in this very health conscious direction uh, alongside of being an advocate or an activist with Fridays for Future or something. What type of youth things that are getting you excited now? What are you seeing and in, in reaching this new audience, uh, this new generation that's coming up and saying, man, boy, the food systems broke from our elders, from our parents. Yeah, I, I mean, I think there's a, a huge amount of enthusiasm for from youth for obviously climate issues more broadly, but then also food systems issues specifically. Just in the past couple of months, I've gotten dozens of emails from from students, um, and you know, a massive amount of applications for like a summer fellowship that I'm that I'm um, facilitating, and it just seems like there's this real. Um, drive and, and growing interest um, from students and, and other youth who who want to to take a role um, in in making the our world a, a better place through food um, and you know I, I I I've heard for instance that like the Biden administration is is really wants to prioritize um, the youth voices as as part of of the climate climate solutions coming from the U S. Um, I, you know, we'll, we'll see if that, if that happens. Um, <laughs> um, I, I, I think it's important that, um, when we do engage youth, we do it in a really like authentic and, and meaningful way. And, um, um, but I think the great thing about this, this world is that, you know, we need, we need activists who, who want to be on the street and, you know, who are grassroots organizers, but we also need like biochemists. And biochemists and, and bioengineers and um, people who want to be lobbyists to lobby for for to, you know good aspects of our food system and um, we need we need lawyers and um, so it I, I think that I think that there are just like so many entry points into this work and that regardless of what your skill set is whether that's coding or public speaking like. Both of those are really important, and um, I, you know, the Good Food Institute has a one of our my favorite programs is is called the Alt Protein Project, and so we help create student groups at universities around the world, um, and help provide students 
opportunities to learn more about potential career paths in the alternative protein world, but also those students work with professors and, and, and nudge professors and inspire professors to start doing research in this space because there's a, a, you know, a, a huge amount of research that still needs to be done in order to um, bring, bring prices down to, to scale these industries. Um, so again, it, it's, it's just really inspiring to me that there's growing interest from young people um, and that there are also, I think, just an endless amount of opportunities for, for young people to engage in this work. And it's interesting before this conversation, I was kind of reflecting back on, on my path and like what brought me here. And I, I've always loved food. I've loved cooking and, um, and kind of fell into a sustainable food career in some ways through a, a really wonderful class in college called fast food, slow food. And it was all about industrial agriculture and, and you know, uh, various more sustainable alternatives to that. Um, and at the time, so much of the conversation, this was in like 2006 or so, was about food miles and, you know, how far our food travels to get to us. Um, and, you know, and, and farmers markets and, and you know, supporting your local and regional food system, which is obviously still ex extremely important. Um, but the conversation has really shifted over the last 10 or 15 years, it, it, in terms, especially in terms of how we think about climate and food and that, um, you know, I want to continue to support my um, my local and regional food system, but that the the, the talk about you know, what we're producing and in what we're consuming um, from a climate perspective actually has a much bigger impact than, than how far things are traveling. Um, and so it's, I, I'm curious to see how that conversation will, will, will change over the, the, the next 10 or 15 years, um, but, but think that there's a place for youth throughout all of that. I totally agree. Do you, um, around alternative proteins, do you, um, do you see it as a trend or do you see it as a, a, a stable pillar in, in the food systems? I, I personally, um, in, in the EU, and I'm in Germany, but in the EU, the, the different ways to speak about cellular agriculture, uh, they don't use the word cultivated meat. They use kind of an in vitro meat term. It, uh, it translated to me, it sounds, you know, like you're growing some kind of a baby in, in, in vitro fertilization. And I'm like, oh, that doesn't conjure the, the most beautiful images. Yeah. But some of the wisdoms around the laws and the policies are there are, are kind of, they're almost scary for some businesses, for for people on point of entry, but really when you look at the production or the way it goes in, it's not a trend, it's not a niche, it's actually just a better way of production, of producing overall. I'm wondering what you're seeing if that's as a trend or what you're seeing moving forward in this area and how quickly is that path um, to get there? I mean, do you see it taking us a long time, 10, 20 years, or do you see it happening much faster now that Singapore's already came online last year with the chicken nugget? Yeah, so um, just on the kind of in vitro or lab grown term, uh, the, the reason why we don't use that in addition to it being like not very appealing um, is that, you know, if you think about any food product that that's being manufactured right now it was typically like initiated the, the initial like r d was done in a laboratory right and now it's done in a in a, in a manufacturing facility in a production facility and that's the same thing for cultivated meat there are um a lot of the startups are still on the kind of bench bench scale um research level but as the production scales it's no longer going to be in a in the laboratory so you know, we don't call them lab-grown Skittles or lab-grown uh, Doritos. Um, we just call them Doritos. <laughs> so uh, uh, we, that's why we, we, we don't use that terminology. And, um, you know, there are a variety of, of, of um, kind of market projections that have been done by, by, by different um, industry groups. 
about the growth of alternative proteins and they they vary quite significantly. We don't necessarily subscribe to, to one of those versus the other. Um, but I, I, I do think this is here to stay. I don't think it's a fad. Um, and I think that the, the rate of growth and kind of market penetration a lot of that's going to depend on um, the level of investment from the private sector, but even more so from the public sector. Um, I, we think that that public publicly funded research and development, where the results of that are open access and, and any entrepreneur or scientist can have, have the results of that, is really what's needed to, to accelerate the growth. Um, and um, so we're, we're urging the US government to invest in alternative protein R&D and we're, we've seen other countries around the world invest in this. Um, and so I, I think a lot of the, the growth is gonna depend on that level of investment. Obviously consumer demand is going to, to drive this as well, um, but I'm confident that um, if companies continue to produce products that are just as delicious as their animal counterparts and that the, if prices can continue to, um, if prices can start to come down and, you know, be competitive with um, industrial animal products, then, then things are really here to stay. And we, um, CE Delft, which is a um, life cycle assessment firm um, in Europe, they recently wrapped up a life cycle analysis of modeling cultivated meat production in a facility in, in 2030. Um, and um, they projected that at that point, cultivated, there's, it's potential, there's, there's a potential for cultivated meat to be cost competitive um, with some forms of, of animal meat. Um, there, you know, and the, if anyone's an, an LCA um, a geek and really wants to read the details of that, all of, all of that's on our, on our website. But I, I think the, um, you know, we talk about taste, price, and convenience, and that's what, that's why, how consumers make food decisions. And um, the, the growth of the, of these industries is going to rely on things being just as tasty, just as portable, and just as convenient as, as their animal counterparts. Um, I think another sign that this is, this is here to stay is that we're seeing a lot of big food companies invest in um, alternative, either investing in kind of cultivated meat companies themselves or creating plant-based lines um, as, uh, as a part of their, their, their product line. And I, I, I think a lot of that's because you know they know it's good business and um, that there's growing consumer demand. Um, but you know we're still at a, just about one percent of the retail meat market in the U.S. for plant-based meat. So there's tons of buzz about it, but it's there's still lots of room for for growth um, and um, and and market penetration. Yeah, the market's huge and untapped. I have a couple things here. Where is it? I wanted to show you. Um, it's Bill Gates' new book. He actually mm -hmm. said something really nice about cellular agriculture. Yeah. What do you feel about that? Uh, I don't even know if that, no, I don't have his book here. Yeah. So, um, you know, in the climate world, there's a call for electrify everything, right? We want electric vehicles. We want um, that that if we can produce our electricity via renewable sources, that like that's a big part of the solution. And um, Bill Gates is talks about how uh, cultivated meat is an opportunity to basically electrify our, our meat production. That the the bulk of the climate impact of cultivated meat production will be in the actual production facility. Um, and if that facility can be powered with renewable energy, um, the, the carbon footprint of this production is, is really minimal. Um, so it's, it's, it's great that folks like Bill Gates are, are, are calling out the, the climate opportunities here. His group Breakthrough Energy <clears throat> um, also released recently released a, a federal policy playbook for what the US government should be doing to fight the climate crisis. And, one, one aspect of that was 
is to for the federal government to invest in alternative protein research and to also provide incentives for the the private sector to to, to scale up. So um, it's it's great that we've got Bill Gates as an ally. Yeah, I think there's uh, there are plus and minuses that anybody could see out of that. But it was in, in a, I I was got an advanced copy of his book and. And then also heard his quotes and things around. So I thought that was a fabulous. In Germany, the uh, and it's also throughout the EU, but it's mainly focused in Germany. There's a a uh, traditional family company called Riedenwald and Müller, Müller, and they do um, uh, sausages and uh, sliced deli meats and things like that, and different meat products. Uh, they made the switch in 2000 and um, slowly in 2013, 2013, and then really hard in 2015, and then doubled down in 2018 and said, you know, we're going to go 100% vegan, plant-based products. And they it was actually even in 2015, they said, our plant-based products have overtaken our meat-based products. They're going like wildfires and we can't keep them on the shelf enough. And uh, what they realized is that it was just a better, they could use their old machinery mm. with the new products of plant-based meats. And so they were actually, there was not a bigger uh, cost involved. They were able to re reduce their cost of goods sold, sell the product at the same price as the meat product. And so they actually were making a profit. And that was before they even thought about sustainable production methods. Now, and uh, I think it was already in 2018, they said, okay, you know, we want to take and, and start using renewable energy and non-finite resources in different ways in our production methods, sustainable supply chain and sourcing and things to make sure that that is a really, they, they realized again, a better business model reduces the cogs where it can be market competitive but it's just a better long-term sustainable model. And I'm seeing that not just with, with that example here in Germany, but all around the world that those who are getting into alternate proteins are really watching where does our energy come from and how where do our sustainable supply chains and the medium input that we put into uh, our, our um, cellular agriculture or precision or uh, precision fermentation and that where are those inputs are they sustainable what's the supply chain on them are they short are they local can we do them in a closed system ourselves and they're realizing so it's not just an add-on of a new trend or a niche as an alternate protein or precision fermentation or whatever you call it um, for for I, new ice creams that are non-dairy, things like that, that now um, are you just say, okay, that's just an add-on to the old system as is. No, it's an entire new operating model, new machinery, new methods, new energies. And it's really based on that, that water energy food nexus on where, how, how that fits together, which is a system of itself. And so I'm loving to, to see those type of models Another thing that we've seen um, during the pandemic is this huge spike in, in alternate milks or different uh, plant-based milk products, so mm -hmm. to say, or, or precision fermentation milk uh, products coming onto the market. Now that the dairy industry or the meat industry is coming back and saying, you can't call it meat, which is one thing that was one, but the dairy industry, for some re reason, still held on that you can't call it meat uh, or milk. Uh, it has to be called something else. And so I want, would like to get to know your, your feelings or what you've seen in, the, in those, not friends, those markets or those movements in the industry in those respects. And what is that, that, that pushback or that fight from those industries telling us that we're on the right path or... <laughs> Or, uh, or what, how should we look at that? And, and how, do, how do we understand that? Even just from a consumer base on that, the, the big confusion that we're seeing. Yeah, so we've been involved in some, um, some of the legislation in the US at the, at the state level primarily with states trying to ban the use of meat or dairy terms on, on labels. And, um, and, and 
these cases, you know, there are claims of consumer confusion, but no evidence uh, that consumers are confused. You know, we're, we're not hearing reports that the consumers are, are calling up a, a state office and saying, I bought Beyond Meat and I thought I was getting ground beef. Um, you know, I, I, I want to process a claim or, or, you know, make a complaint about this. Um, so I, I do think most of it is, um, is there, it's a protectionist attempt from the incumbent industry. And in the U.S., we use First Amendment arguments um, that, um, that these companies have the freedom of speech to label their products in a, in a clear way. Um, as long as they're not confusing to consumers, then they have the right to label them. Um, and there are also already federal laws that, um, that, that uh, mandate labeling requirements and all of these labels fit within, within those requirements. So I do think you're, I, 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 I think you have a good point that, you know, if, if this industry wasn't a threat to the conventional, um, you know, dairy or cattle industry, we probably wouldn't be seeing these laws. So it, I think it is a, a, um, a sign that these, these industries are growing. I, I you know, plant-based milk, especially now, it, it has something like 14% of the market share in the U.S. Um, and that's grown over the past couple of decades and in, in particular um, for, for a lot of reasons. Some of that is lactose intolerance, it's environmental reasons, it's health reasons. And so I, I think that there is a concern from the industrial meat industry that we'll see similar trends um, with plant-based meats over the next couple of uh, decades and that they want to kind of do whatever they can to, to limit that. Um, and in and, and general, we, we haven't seen much success with those bills. The, the governor of Virginia last year, actually, um, the only bill that he vetoed um, the entire legislative session was a, um, a milk labeling bill. Um, and so that, that did not pass in, in Virginia. Um, and, you know, I, I I totally understand that, especially the dairy industry in the U.S. is is really struggling, and lawmakers want to, you know, to to show that they're they're doing something to try to help their constituents. Um, I, I I don't think that this is the most effective way if they truly want to help those industries to um, to to make a real change. It's it's more kind of a messaging. Um, a, a messaging ploy, in my opinion, and we've seen some bills also at the federal level, but nothing has has gained any traction. Um, so we're confident that the kind of the existing regulatory framework for for labeling products um, is is consistent, and that you can use modifiers. You know, just like um, you know, people know that goat milk comes from a goat, not from a cow. Um, just like people know that soy milk comes from soybeans, um, not, from, not from a cow. Um, so, uh, we, but we do work to, to, to fight any of those, um, we call them label censorship bills if they, if they come our way. Um, but we'd obviously rather spend our time um, uh, using our policy energy and in other ways. Um, and one one example of that that I'll that I'll mention is um, in California we've worked with a assembly member to introduce a bill that would uh, incentivize farmers to transition from animal production um, or animal feed production into um, uh, producing crops that could be used as plant-based inputs and to provide financial incentives and technical assistance. Um, so I, I, I think sometimes in the agriculture community, there's a sense that alternative proteins means an end to like rural, rural livelihoods and farming communities. And that, that, that's not the case, you know, especially with plant-based meat the inputs are plants and they need to be grown by people. And we, um, we want farmers to, to be stewards of the land and to, to produce these crops that, that are going to be in demand um, for plant-based products. And um, most plant-based products right now are, are using um, 
what's readily available. So, you know, soy and, and wheat and to a certain extent peas, but there are, there are hundreds of other plants out there that could potentially be used as protein sources for plant-based meat. And so that's some of the research that we um, we're seeing happening and we think that there needs to be more of like, what are the other um, uh, crops that are probably higher value and may, you know, will make farmers more money um, that can be nutritious protein sources that can be used as, as inputs. So I, I definitely think there's, there's a very crucial role of the farmer in these, in these supply chains. I, I definitely agree. I also see that there's not only in cellular agriculture, but in precision fermentation, there are some old dairy farms, some old um, beef farms uh, or animal agriculture farms out there that um, could very well have a bioreactor or, or um, you know, precision fermentation in a lot of respects is very similar to yogurt cultivation and, and making milk processes or brewing beer processes where in some respects, some of those tools could be set up right at the farm and, and also kind of do that farm to fork or the very regional local things where they're getting the cells from those same bovine or the same animals on the farm if, if they're good quality meat and, and just changing that process or that old industry into one that's a little bit more sustainable, more long-term, more uh, in mind with the farmer. Because over the years, I don't, I don't think there's even in the animal agriculture, there's too many that are saying, boy, this is just the biggest profit margins and the best industry. They're always like, we've all got to do it cheaper, cheaper, cheaper. And, and we've got somewhere, you've got to cut the corners and you've got to not pay somebody or, or make, make some reductions. It's just a model that can't go on forever. Um, if they can find a way to keep it going on while we move to some better alternatives, great, more power to them. But um, I think we, we really need to uh, realize that we're, they're not going to lose the jobs. There are going to be some alternatives in many different areas to to still do that locally. And that's the, the objective is to, to change the systems as well. Uh, along that same lines, I, I, I want to kind of ask your thoughts or opinions on do you feel that the industry currently is up to speed and in, in the way they produce, the way that they look at uh, producing food that's healthy for humans, and, but also healthy for our planet and environment? And how, how does this alternate proteins really tie in to the climate crisis? Why is that a, another tool or is it another tool to fight the climate crisis? So, you know, all the, the founders of various alternative protein companies, you know, all have different reasons for, for starting their, their companies. I think for some of, you know, for some of them, it may be animal welfare. For some, it may be sustain environmental sustainability. For some, um, it may be just a, you know, a strong fascination with it, the power of this amazing technology that's emerging. Um, but, um, um, I absolutely think that alternative proteins are an important part of solving the, the climate crisis. You know, I, I think the science is pretty well understood in terms of if our food system doesn't change, we, we can't meet the goals of the, the Paris Agreement. We can't keep warming below 1.5 degrees. Um, and that alternative proteins offer a way to produce, like I said, the, the, the products that people love, but with significant, with significant um, less impact on, on the environment. And the studies that have been done thus far around plant-based meat, you know, some of them show that it's in the like 90% um, less greenhouse gas emissions um, are used for producing these products than their, their conventional animal counterparts. Um, and that's, that's significant. You know, you think about um, a place like Burger King that now has the impossible Whopper. If, if, if someone is eating at Burger King a couple times a week and once a week they choose the impossible Whopper as opposed to the normal Whopper, over a period of time that, and you think about that, you know, scaled nationally or globally, that has a really significant impact. Um, 
and we're we're still in the beginning stages of of these industries so as more products come on the market there there's a, a broader diversity that consumers can choose from you know um, products improve in, in, in taste and in, in price. It's just going to continue to grow. Um, and I think that there's also a, a really strong argument in terms of land use and, um, uh, and reducing or, or um, the amount of deforestation and, and protection of, of biodiversity. Um, you know, the, a significant portion of, of land in our world is used to, to raise animals for food and then also to raise the crops to, to feed those animals. And that if we can just raise the crops and produce those directly into um, plant-based meat, we're, we're, we're taking a big chunk of that land out of the equation. And as, as we're hearing on a regular basis, like the deforestation is a, a major cause of, of climate change. It's continuing at really rapid rates. Um, and I think that the growth of alternative proteins is one way to, to slow that down. And the, the, the excess land that is freed up in this, in this scenario can be used for, you know, carbon capture and, or for, you know, um, producing renewable energy, or even for for doing um, well managed regenerative agriculture. Um, so, I, I I think that um, this is is an important part of the conversation. You know, as as you know, food is often left out of the conversation in general when it comes to climate. Um, you know, many places don't track their their scope three emissions. Um, I but I think that's that is starting to change, you know, with things like the UN Food System Summit, and you know the fact that you you spoke at the pre-COP about about food issues, um, um, and and so I, I think that alternative proteins need to need to be part of the conversation um, when we talk about um, fighting the climate crisis through the lens of lens of food. Um, and I will also add, you know, we often don't talk about seafood, um, but the alternative seafood um, is also is also an industry and um, plant based seafood in general is, is definitely behind the plant based um, meat and dairy uh, world, but we have a sustainable seafood initiative at GFI that's specifically working to 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 grow the sustainable um, uh, seafood world. Um, and I think that there we're going to see continued and more conversations around the connections between seafood and, and climate. Um, I think there was a study that came out a couple of weeks ago that showed that you know, ocean trawling um, may release as much carbon as air travel, um, which is just baffling and, and really horrifying. And so all, alternative seafood, both plant-based and cultivated seafood is, um, is another opportunity to both um, protect ocean um, biodiversity and, and support ocean conservation, um, which is obviously you know, one of the sustainable development goals um, while also helping to fight the climate crisis. Yeah, that's a, it's a huge area. It's actually bigger than meat. Uh, seafood is a big, big aspect of food source for our world and uh, affects uh, so, so many people. I, I, I really am hopeful, you know, I know of some salmon, um, different salmon alternatives that are being worked on. Um, it, there was, and I can't remember the name of them, but I know you guys work with them, Bruce uh, Friedrich, and, and uh, that were in the salmon company was in a book that, uh, on a podcast I did for Jenny Liebman, who wrote uh, Sex Robots and Vegan Meat, and she she <laughs> talked to the the salmon guys there in California and. Really, uh, there's some great things coming down the line, and it would be a, a, a big need for that as well. Uh, it's, it's, it's just for me, it's, so, it's such a fabulously exciting area. Not not so I kind of it's not only alternative proteins, it's precision fermentation, it's these different options um, 
to do food it doesn't always have to be sustainable but in a sustainable way differently providing the same types of products that probably in, in most respects are better for health and for the environment and really reduce a, a lot of human suffering and and these impacts um the the seafood industry as you mentioned with with the trolling and that is is multifaceted in and of itself for all the impacts that they have around not just shipping emissions, but on bycatch, on trolling, on illegal fishing. Um, it, it's, it's actually 10 times minimum worse than the airline air travel industry. So, um, and I have the charts and the data to prove what I showed in a lot of my presentations and talks, but for, for some of us, mainly in the Western world, we're just not aware of, of what's going on in the waters because we're not on a boat, on a ship a lot of the time. And so it's out of sight, out of mind. Um, I really have only three more, no, four more major questions for you, but there's only one more that's going to be the hard one for you. I don't think I've given <laughs> you a hard one so far. Um, and and it, it's really the, the burning question WTF, and it's not the swear word, although I'm sure many of us and maybe even you have said that this uh, past 12 months or more that we've been dealing with the pandemic, but it's the burning question, what's the future? And I'd like to know from your viewpoint and also from Good Food Institute, you know, do we have hope? Is there a good vision? What's the future? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the reason why I love this work is because it's solutions oriented. And so I absolutely have have hope for the future. Um, I, I don't have kids right now, but I want to have kids someday. And I, I wouldn't want to bring a child into the world unless um, I had hope that they had the potential to, to live a, a happy and fruitful and, and safe and productive life. Um, I, I, I think that I, I think it's going to be a, a bumpy road. I don't think it's going to be easy. Um, but I think this last year has has taught the world that we we have some some major issues that we need to to work together to 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 achieve a better future and a, a part of a big part of that is a better future of food. So. You know, I, I envision a future where um, our food supply is is safe and resilient, and it's it's not leading to antibiotic resistance. It's not leading to um, things like deforestation and, and and cutting down the rainforest. That we can actually um, use food as as part of the solution, and it's not a leading driver of of the problem. Um, and you know, we often, when I think of the future, I think the word, uh, the, the year 2050 is, is the year that comes, comes to mind, um, um, which in a lot of ways feels, feels very far off, but I know it's gonna be here, but before then, um, bef before we know it. And um, it's, there's the potential for, for things to go in a, a lot of different directions, but I think, um, kind of, uh, I think politically across the world where we're headed in a fairly good direction. I think that there's a, a growing understanding and kind of this growing consciousness that um, we, we need to make ships and that um, there are, are more and more opportunities for, for individuals as well as for organizations to, to take part in, in this work on a, on a daily basis. So I, I absolutely feel optimistic and um, feel extremely lucky that I get to be part of that solution, both in my personal life and in my professional life. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Can you tell us, is there anything that you're really excited about or new things that we should be watching for from the Good Food Institute that are on the horizon? besides the UN Food System Summit, some things that you guys are working on and maybe a little teasers of what, what we can expect or looking for um, from you guys in the future? Yeah, we're, um, we're definitely ramping up our work on climate change. Um, 
it feels really great at the federal level that this is something we can really actively talk about and, and push hard. So um, everything from um, you know thinking about uh, how to include alternative proteins as a part of President Biden's climate strategy to um, you know thinking about how alternative proteins could be part of you know international climate negotiations with with other countries. So I, I think there's some exciting stuff on the horizon around that. Um, we're, we're also doing some uh, exciting work around exploring the, you know, the, the labor impacts of the growth of alternative proteins um, based on different market projections in the future. Um, so kind of getting to some of the conversation we had earlier, um, you know, what do we expect to see around, around labor um, uh, changes and, and what can we do proactively to make sure that um, as alternative proteins grow, that um, these transitions can be as equitable and just as as possible. Um, and we're, you know, we want to continue to um, to I think bring fermentation, as you mentioned, more to the forefront around alternative proteins. Um, you know, we've tended to talk mostly about cultivated and, and plant based meat, but um, precision fermentation is a, a really exciting pillar of alternative proteins. And I expect over the next couple of years, we're going to stop talking about alternative proteins in kind of these separate categories. And it's going to be more of a spectrum, especially as um, cultivated products come to the market. So, you know, we may, it, it wouldn't surprise me if before you see a cultivated beef burger in the US, for instance, we see a, a plant based burger that has cultivated fat as part of it and kind of the blending of of these technologies um, across product lines, I, I think is going to really open a whole new um, whole new world for what we think about and what the consumer um, experiences for alternative proteins. When Joe Biden and Camilla Harris got into office, uh, not only was I ecstatic, but I I was really excited that they went in and Joe that uh, President Biden went in immediately uh, doubled down on the Paris Agreement, got the U.S. back in the Paris Agreement, and and did a lot of things for electric mobility and and moving forward to just kind of to fix some issues. Um, one thing that I was surprised, and you know, I don't know if it happened, um, is that we, we saw not only when Al Gore was trying, went from vice president to try to be president, and there was the dimple chad, to now with what happened with Trump and Biden, that there's a huge issue in politics and in the voting and, and issues that happened in that transition, that that wouldn't be, something that he would have immediately jumped on and says we need to fix our voting system or something's wrong with with uh how that process works and we can't have this happen in another four years or whenever um that occurs that kind of being the caveat of of an example of what happens when you let a bad system or something that's broken already go on for too long and don't fix and repair it and in that respects for food and food policy um, and, I, and I even think that Trump and, and others have, have allowed some bad policies or, or bad lobbyists to come in and really manipulate the food system or policies out there. What are some things now that you're doing now, maybe in, in, in the forefront to think, hey, we didn't make, need to make sure that we paved the way or get the right policies in place or make sure that these bad policies are out of there so that that we don't run into the problem in the future when the next crazy person comes or you know whatever that will really fix the food system and, and this kind of ties into the UN food system summit but for the US specifically are you thinking in in those terms at all what are some of the long term uh, safety measures you're 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 addressing or thinking about yeah i mean for me personally i think one of the biggest challenges we face is that the way the, the the food and food policy system is set up is that it leads us to not paying the, the true cost of food. Um, 
And that's for, you know, true cost in terms of environmental impacts and, and social impacts and, and what it truly takes for, for farmers and producers to, to, to grow and raise that food. So I think there are some really major shifts that need to be um, that, that need to be made in, in order to shift that while also making sure that food is uh, affordable and at a price point that, that everyone can afford healthy food, particularly. Um, kind of at organizationally, what we're really focused on is, is the fact that for, um, for, for, for so long, agricultural research has been, has been uh, lifting up and, and supporting and um, um, these, these incumbent industries and that there isn't public research funding that is dedicated to alternatives like alternative proteins and that um, it's really, it's, it's, it's not a fair, it's, it's, it's not, it's not a fair competition right now where, you know, obviously these industries are new, um, but that we, they also need support um, via, via federal dollars um, in order to, to make this growth happen. And, you know, you think back to some of the, the biggest tech technological revolutions um, in our food system over the last decade. And a lot of those um, in our food system, but also um, outside of our food system, you know, things like the, the, the internet and, and touchscreen phones, um, all of those originated from um, public research. Um, and so we are, are, are really doubling down to try to uh, secure public research um, funding for alternative proteins um, so that we can, we can accelerate the, this transition as, as quickly as possible. That's great. That's great to hear. If there was a sustainable takeaway message that you could depart to my listeners that had the power to impact or empower their lives, your message, that one message, what would it be? Hmm. So I, I think the term sustainable means, means a lot of different things. And part of it ties into this resiliency and making sure that your, your own life, you're, you're living in a, in a sustainable way so that you can sustain yourself um, to, to continue fighting the good fight, whatever that is, that is for you. So I think one would be to, to really make sure that you're, you're listening to yourself and that you're, you're, you're giving your, your body and your mind and your soul, the, the nourishment it needs. Um, and, and then the second one on the um, kind of more professional lane is um, to, to, to make your voice heard about, about what you want in our, in our food system. Um, and I, I used to be, I think, a little bit intimidated by my ability to participate in our political system. Um, but um, uh, now don't shy away from, from, from calling my representatives um, and, and, and making that voice heard. Um, and also making your voice heard in, in terms of where you buy your food. If, if, if you want to see a product on your grocery market shelf and it's not there, like talk to someone about it. If, if, if there's a product there and it's not your favorite and you, you think it needs some improvement, like shoot the company a, a tweet or send them a message and, and let them know that feedback. Um, I think that we often underestimate the power of our, of our voices and would encourage your listeners to, um, to really take hold of that power. What should young innovators in your field be thinking about to look or looking for ways to make a real impact? So I would encourage folks to go to our, our website. We have a a list of all of the alternative protein companies list um, jobs and would, would encourage people to take a look at kind of the range of, of jobs that are currently available in these industries and see if you you have a skill set that, that fits with those. Um, if you're still in the process of, of, of your schooling and are trying to figure out kind of what your path is, I think that's also a really great way to, um, to feel out what are potential um, future career opportunities going to look like because as we talked about this this is only going to continue to grow and and we need um, smart passionate um, young folks to, to to 
um, make this growth possible. The last question I have for you is really, what have you experienced or learned in your professional journey so far that you would have loved to know from the start? I have, I think I've done a really great job of um, kind of following my, my passion. Um, and obviously, I, th I think that comes from a, a place of privilege to be able to do that. Um, and I, I feel very privileged to have had those opportunities, but to, to, to really kind of go with my gut and to, to be okay with that, to, to not second guess those, um, those career moves or those schooling moves. And um, to, I, I think I would have liked someone to tell me to just kind of chill out. And um, if, I'm, if I'm listening to my gut, then that's, that's probably the right move. I thank you very much, Emily, for lending us inside your ideas on this episode. It's been a sheer pleasure to get your wisdom and your insight on the important work that you're doing. And I hope to see you in Glasgow and, and, and New York at the UN Food System Summit. I don't know if you'll make it to Rome uh, in June, but uh, I definitely want to see you around. And I'm looking forward to many more wonderful things from the Good Food Institute and from you. Thank yes, you very thanks much. Thanks so much for having me, Mark. I really appreciate it. It was so good to have you. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye bye. Bye.